This is Radio EcoShock with Alex Smith. To Radio EcoShock, and what a show we have for you this week. Arnie Gunderson covers the world's worst nuclear dangers from the ongoing poisoning of the Pacific Ocean by the meltdowns at Fukushima, Japan, to America's disaster in waiting right in California. Arnie releases some new information about the nuclear danger right here on Radio EcoShock. Oh yeah, and the nuclear plume is hitting the West Coast right now. Then we'll talk through the battle of capitalist profits versus the climate and all of nature. Our guest will be Naomi Klein, author of the new book, This Changes Everything. Ready, set, go. In early October, two typhoons swept over Japan. The TV showed flooding in Tokyo, but they forgot to mention the nuclear disaster site at Fukushima. The worst flash floods up to 10 inches of rain were predicted for Fukushima Prefecture, where three blown reactors already leak 300 tons of radioactive water into the Pacific on a good day, each and every day. We're going to get an update on Fukushima, the mess there from our favorite correspondent, Arnie Gunderson. He's a former nuclear industry executive who now gives expert testimony on reactor safety. His videos on the website, fairwinds.com, are the best anywhere. Arnie, welcome back to Radio EcoShock. Thanks for having me. It's been quite a while. It has been a while, but it's time to get Fukushima back into the news. You know, as we know, it's it's like curse that keeps on giving day after day and well year after decade and i want to get the latest on that uh then we should talk about the possible fukushima and waiting right in california i know you have a new report on the diablo canyon reactors but let's start with this underreported or even unreported news about the crippled fukushima daiichi nuclear complex right on the east side of japan there were two typhoons in a row fan phone and vong fong what have you heard well, let's go back to the week that the accident began three years ago. The, uh, when the cores melted down, the nuclear containments were really not designed for the temperature and the high radiation that they experienced. So what happened was all of the rubber seals that allow electric wires to go in and out and that um, allow the pipes to go in and out, all of those rubber seals failed. So even though the nuclear reactor core didn't melt through the concrete, what happened is that the groundwater is coming in through the holes in the walls. So for the last three years, there's been, as you said, 300 tons of water passing through that nuclear reactor and out into the Pacific every day. So the problem was in effect back a month after the nuclear accident occurred. And there were things they could have done back then. I, I recommend it, uh, pumping down the groundwater, but between the pumps and the nuclear reactor, having something called a zeolite trench. Zeolite is a really good material. It's volcanic that uh, would capture all of the radioactive cesium and most of the other isotopes. Well, I was told three years ago that Tokyo Electric didn't have the money. Well, it's one of those pay me now or pay me later. Because they didn't, keep that groundwater under control three years ago, now they're paying the price. So these typhoons come along and dump, uh, as you said, 10 inches of rain, an enormous amount of rain in a very short time. And in addition to the 300 tons that's normally leaking in, now there's a lot more. So the, all of the trenches that go connect different parts of the plant are now overflowing and leaking into the ground as well. You know, when you compare Fukushima to uh, Chernobyl, the total release of radioactivity from Fukushima is worse than the total release from Chernobyl. Chernobyl may have released you know, 20 or 30 percent more into the air, but this ongoing leak of radioactivity into the groundwater never happened at Chernobyl. So we've got the, the plant is continuing to bleed directly into the Pacific day in, day out, and whenever you get an excessive rainfall, essentially it pops an artery and, and, and flows even more hundreds of tons into the Pacific. And, and it's not a problem that's going to go away. After Chernobyl, a year after Chernobyl, they had pictures of the nuclear reactor core. And a year and a half after TMI, Three Mile Island, they had pictures of the reactor core. Well, Fukushima is so radioactive, no one's gotten near it yet. We don't even know where this nuclear reactor core is, let alone try to stop it from leaking into the groundwater. Uh, it's a real mess. 
it could have been mitigated three years ago, but, uh, you know, that's saying the horse is out of the barn now and you're not going to get it back. Tokyo Electric was penny wise and pound foolish. There were chances to stop this in the first month, and they just didn't do it. And we know, Arnie, that TEPCO has been pumping hundreds of tons of highly radioactive water to storage tanks on the site, and that's pumped from the area around the reactor cores, even though we don't know where they are, and from the area generally. Now, the Japanese have repeatedly warned they're running out of storage. Did they dump some of that water into the Pacific? Well, they are running out of storage if you limit their storage space to the site. But right over the fence boundary is totally uninhabitable land, too. So if they really wanted to, they could extend these tank farms into land that's adjacent to the plant. Politically, they don't want to do that. They want to start dumping water as opposed to capturing water. The biggest problem, in my mind, with these tanks, uh, there's two problems. First off, if there's another uh, severe earthquake, a Richter 7, not the Richter 9 that was off the coast, but a Richter 7, all of these tanks are not seismically qualified. And they'll all fail and run down into the Pacific in mass, which would be um, an insult to the Pacific that has, has never occurred in the history of the world. So the, the first issue is they've got all these non-seismically qualified tanks that they're throwing up still at uh, two a week. And those tanks then run the risk of, of failure in a seismic event. The second thing, though, what, what TEPCO is doing is they're attempting to clean the water in the tank with filters. And they've been reasonably successful. You know, when they can do a tank, and, and there's so many tanks, there's so many they haven't gotten to, they can remove about 90% of the radiation from the tank. The radiation levels are still so high that if that tank were in any other country of the world, we certainly wouldn't think about releasing it into the Pacific. But considering how bad Fukushima is, the, the Japanese seem to consider that as, uh, you know, 90% is good enough. But the other half of that is that all of that radioactive material now is in filters, sitting in, you know, like a, like a Brita filter when you... Uh, when you take a Brita filter out of your sink, you can walk over your trash can and throw that Brita filter into the trash can. Well, the filters that TEPCO is using now contain all of that radiation that was in the water. And it's not just cesium. Cesium is bad enough. These filters are going to have to be stored for 300 years somewhere. But because the nuclear core is melted down, what we've got now is strontium, which is a really bad chemical. It's a bone seeker that causes all sorts of uh, cancers, but also plutonium. The nuclear reactor has breached, and we're getting plutonium in the groundwater, which is now winding up in these filters. Well, plutonium stays radioactive for a quarter of a million years, and the Japanese are not being honest with their population. They're not telling them that, oh, by the way, in addition to these nuclear cores, whenever we find them, We've got thousands of filters that now have essentially pieces of the nuclear core in them that we're also going to have to store for a quarter of a million years. So by filtering the water, they've reduced the liquid problem, but they've created a huge solid radioactive waste problem that no one, you, you've got an exclusive here, Alex, and no one in the, uh, in the world is talking about where are they going to store all of these filters for a quarter of a million years. A quarter of a million years, no problem. We should be able to look after them that long. Wow. Well, the Japanese press tells us the operator, TEPCO, plans to remove that temporary outer shell from the number one reactor. Is there a danger there? Well, it, it increases the airborne radioactive releases. The reactor itself has been breached, and the reactor containment has been breached. Most of that breach is in the form of liquid radiation leaking out. But, you know, there's holes in the side of this thing that are continuously releasing gaseous radioactivity. So when they put that tent over top, that white tent over top of the building, that building was called the reactor building. It was designed to catch all those gases. And I, I can't figure out why they're doing it. They're basically allowing the airborne radiation that gets out to uh, float freely throughout Fukushima Prefecture again. 
you know, it's nowhere near as bad as on the day of the accident, but if it were a, an operating plant in anywhere in the world, the releases from that building would be called excessive and the reactor would be shut down. Of course, at Fukushima, there's a different set of rules in place. Well, it's been a few years now since the big accident. We've heard almost nothing about the impacts on people in that region. There are accounts coming out of there of strange tumors, kids dying, pets dying. What have you heard, and can we ever expect an honest accounting from Japanese authorities? But that's a pretty good, pretty good summary, frankly. We continue to get uh, information from people who live there about cancer rates and illnesses in general not just cancer. Now, we think of radiation as a, a cancer-causing thing, but it also causes uh, many other ailments. Uh, much higher incidences of a whole range of, of illnesses than they had in, you know, in 2010, the year before the accident. You know, we, we work with a woman who, uh, she has a garden. She's an organic gardener. And she's, every year, she's taken the seeds from her garden planted and then harvested seeds from those plants to be the next year's crop. So she's got four years now of seeds that have been growing you know, about 30 miles from Fukushima. And she's beginning to experience uh, gargantuism in her food now, which is an indication of radiation damage. You know, it's one of the many DNA changes that occurs after a couple of, of generations. So we know that gardeners, uh, you know, and, and plants that are outside the exclusion zone are seeing the effects of chronic levels of radiation that the Japanese government would choose to ignore. We're also working with doctors in Japan, and some brave doctors are saying that they've been threatened, that their hospital rights have been uh, threatened. You know, if, if you tell your patient this illness is radiation related, you'll lose your right to practice and things like that. So there's an enormous pressure on the medical community to tell the patients that what they're experiencing is not at all related to radiation. But you know, the, the key is statistics. And uh, the question is, when will the statistics be released for, um, uh, you know, mortality, morbidity, and then general general illnesses in Fukushima Prefecture. We're not seeing the data. The medical community now has to file every report that it writes with the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, before it's issued. So if you're a hospital and you've got mortality data, you're not allowed to issue that to the public until those reports have been cleared by the IAEA. Well, Article 2 of the IAEA's charter is to promote nuclear power. So even if the hospital was uh, conscientious, and of course there's a lot of political pressure not to be, but even if it was conscientious, there's another, uh, another step in the process, and they've got to clear an IAEA hurdle before those numbers are released. It's truly frightening that the pressure that the medical community is undergoing in Japan, and very few of them are, are willing to tell the truth. Reuters News Service reports that Japanese prosecutors are once again considering criminal charges against executives from Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO. Last year they said no charges, but a special citizens panel is forcing them to reconsider. And, you know, TEPCO is almost an invincible insider. That's a reputation. It's legendary in Japan. Is there any chance that those who should have known about this or could have known about this will be exposed to justice? It's not could have or should have. Uh, they did know about it. There's no doubt about the fact that Tokyo executives in Tokyo knew about the magnitude of the crisis and and stymied effective information being provided to the people. I won't go as far as say that the plant staff was involved. The plant staff acted heroically. Uh, you know, I, I hope when it, when it gets to the point of uh, any indictments that the members of the plant staff in a crisis situation were true heroes. But the people sitting on their um, in their easy chairs in, in Tokyo knew of the magnitude of the problem, should have evacuated earlier, you know, should have asked for uh, assistance earlier, and uh, should have alerted Prime Minister Khan earlier 
You know, I had a talk with Prime Minister Khan last year. He and I were speaking in uh, New York and then the next day in Boston. And I said to him, knowing what he knew from the two people who were providing him information, Tokyo Electric and, and METI, the Industrial Ministry, where nuclear reports, uh, he was getting awful information. And as a policymaker, he could not have gotten the uh, information to um, to evacuate from either of them. And the guy's not a nuclear engineer. So um, he did the best he could with some really miserable information and actually forced Tokyo Electric not to abandon the site. I'm absolutely convinced, and I've met with him several times about this, that Tokyo Electric was going to pull the plug, get out of the site, and let a meltdown destroy Japan. I, I hope people go to jail, but I'm not confident in the Japanese legal system. Their lawyers are very progressive, but their judicial system, their judges, are very conservative. And um, what happens, you know, uh, you'll have a brilliant case get throttled by very conservative judges. And I don't know that that situation is going to get turned around anytime soon. In another move, former Japanese ambassador Mitsui Murata says Japan should back out of the 2020 Olympics. He calls it an honorable retreat, and that's because inviting international guests to a Tokyo still radioactive from the Fukushima disaster is, quote, immoral and unethical. Arnie Gunderson, is Tokyo radioactive, and what are your thoughts about holding the Olympics there? Um, yes, Tokyo is radioactive, and I, I've spoken to Ambassador Murata. And my problem is if we worry about the exposure to Olympic athletes who are going to be there for three weeks, what about the exposure to the people who live in Tokyo for the last 10 years, you know, they'll, they'll nine years from, from 2011 till the 2020 um, Olympics. So I'm afraid it's a little bit elitist to worry about visiting athletes who are going to be there for three weeks when, in fact, 35 million people are exposed to this radiation for nine years. Now, I think the government of, of Japan should be aggressively cleaning up Tokyo, but to do so would spread fear, and that, in turn, would stop the Olympics, which would then crush a nuclear revival that the Abe regime is so, desir it's, it's so desirable to the Abe regime to get those nuclear plants running again. So I think, yes, Tokyo is contaminated, but my pity goes out to the 35 million people who live in it day to day, and the visiting athletes uh, six years further on down the road are at low risk compared to the 35 million that have to live with it. This is Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith with nuclear expert Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds.com. And in just a minute, I'm going to ask you, Arnie, about the facts and rumors about Fukushima radiation reaching the west coast of North America. And we'll get to your new work on what could be the American Fukushima, the risky Diablo Canyon nuclear reactors in California. But I don't want to leave Japan, Arnie, without this one glaring example of wishful thinking. Japanese regulators have ruled that there will be no volcanic eruption near Sendai nuclear plant during its last 30 years of operation. There was just a surprise eruption of Mount Ontake in central Japan this past September 27th. Expert volcanologists have protested nobody knows when volcanoes will go off. Uh, what does this sort of so-called planning tell us about the nuclear industry? I think it's a general hubris that sets into the nuclear industry. You know, is it when you look at these plants, they're, they're impressive pieces of concrete and it must have been like standing in the dock watching the titanic go out to sea i mean this was an impressive engineering feat and and you, we seem to forget the power of mother nature i mean you know tsunami wall was four meters but history showed that tsunamis of the magnitude that hit fukushima 15 meter tsunamis happened less than every thousand years well, the same thing holds for earthquakes and volcanoes. You know, it's not like a volcano is going to pop up and two minutes before the plant has a chance to shut down, uh, it's going to devour the plant. It's, it, no one is suggesting that. But if the plant has to be abandoned, then you need to cool a nuclear reactor for five years because the radioactive material remains physically hot and radioactively hot for hundreds of years. But it remains physically hot for five years. 
So if a volcano were to erupt in the in the vicinity of the of the Sendai plants, the net effect wouldn't be the, the instantaneous failure of the plant, but it would result in abandoning the plant. And when you do that, you're unable to keep it cool, and you've got you know Fukushima all over again. Okay, let's move over to North America. Now, this spring of 2014, a citizen in British Columbia, Canada, found a sample of cesium-134 in a park, and it was inland from the ocean. What would that tell us? We have samples from Vancouver that show cesium-134 and 137 in, uh, in gardens uh, in Vancouver. Um, so it, it didn't surprise me that you're finding uh, 134 in inland regions. Cesium-137 has a 30-year half-life. And if that's all you find, you can't determine whether or not it came from Fukushima or from atomic bomb testing 30 or 40 or 50 years sooner. But when 134 is present, it has a 2-year half-life. So 134 is the signature that it came from Fukushima Daiichi. And like I said, we found gardens in, in Vancouver that had uh, both cesium-137 and 134, which is a clear signature of uh, Fukushima radiation. We've seen that as far north as uh, a little bit north of Vancouver all the way down to Portland, Oregon. That, that area, we've seen contaminated ground samples uh, that have both 134 and 137. So clearly the West Coast was nailed in uh, March and April of 2011. I, I don't think it's it's new contamination. I don't think 134 and 137 are continuing to fall on Vancouver or you know, British Columbia or you know Seattle for that matter. But what you're finding now is the residual radiation that came over in those first waves, the first two months after the accident. Where it's most concentrated, Alex, is in the benthic fish, the fish that thrive on the bottom of rivers and, and ponds. If people really wanted to know if there were radiation, and governments don't seem to want to know this, the place to look is catfish, because catfish are bottom dwellers, and on the upstream side of dams, they are in water that's been trapped. You know, it's run out of the mountains and settles. So that sediment settles into the upstream side of dams. And if, you know, if the British Columbia government really wanted to look, the right thing to do would be to do some core samples on the upstream side of dams or to capture some catfish. Catfish would show strontium in their bones. And that's uh, also another indication of, of Fukushima radiation. I don't know of any government, you know, Washington State, Oregon State, British Columbia, the uh, uh, city of Vancouver, I don't know of any government who's doing that kind of sampling. Uh, I don't think they really want to know the answer. A uh, Canadian research scientist named John Smith just told a meeting of the American Geophysical Union that uh, his group has measured a radioactive plume from Fukushima in Canadian waters. Have you heard about that? Yes, yes. There's also another plume heading a little bit further south down, you know, down the Oregon coast into California, yes. So when is the real radioactivity expected to hit the West Coast, do we know? You know, the plume is, is we are not at the peak. It's, it's still coming. And it will continue to come as long as Fukushima continues to bleed and into the Pacific. So the, the, we're seeing the beginning of, of this concentration gradient, of this flow of radiation. But the real issue is I, I, we get asked all the time, should I swim in the Pacific? And if you're brave enough, because it's awfully cold, you know, swimming in this water is not a problem. I, we've had people say, should I run along the beach because I might inhale the air? The inhalation of this is not the problem. The problem is that the fish that live in that water bioaccumulate that material. So, you know, if there's, say, 10 becquerels per liter of cesium in the water, that's going to be what the fish then digest and concentrate. And then the little fish get eaten by the bigger fish, and it works its way up the food chain. So the, the real issue is not swimming in the water, but it's uh, eating the fish that are in the water. And you know, I've made the personal decision not to eat fish from the Pacific anymore until I know the radiation concentration. 
you know, what, what I expect of my government and, and I expect of the Canadian government as well to tell me what's in that fish. And then as a, uh, as an informed consumer, I can make a decision about whether or not I want to eat it or not. But when I hear these platitudes from, from the United States that uh, it's below safe levels, that's nice, but tell me the number. So as a informed consumer, I can make that decision. I don't want my government to make that decision for me. This is Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith with nuclear expert Arnie Gunderson. Arnie, it's like there's a terrible contest going on to see which could be the next American Fukushima. Vermont Yankees always in the running. Indian Point outside of New York City could have the biggest impact on the most people, but the two California reactors, San Onofre and Diablo Canyon, are the big contenders in my opinion. We know San Onofre was shut down, but there's still 1,600 tons at least of highly radioactive waste sitting on that earthquake zone. Do you feel confident the San Onofre nuclear waste is being safely stored? Not yet. Uh, and by the way, the um, you know, we think of earthquakes as something that happens in California, but the plant with the highest what we call core damage frequency, uh, is actually Indian Point. It's only a mile away from a, uh, a Richter 7.5 earthquake fault that wasn't discovered until after it was, after it was built. So uh, we could have an East Coast earthquake at Indian Point, which would be disastrous. But getting back to your question on San Onofre, if the material gets put into casks, the casks are much safer than the building they're in now. So my thought is that the, the, the priority of officials should be to get that material out of the fuel pool and into casks as quickly as possible. The casks at Fukushima survived the earthquake and the tsunami just fine. It was the fuel pools that didn't. So until San Onofre, the, the fuel in the fuel pool is completely empty and it's in dry casks, then we still have a serious problem. No, the, the choice of dry cask, there are better dry casks than, than they're presently using, but still in comparison to keeping that radiation in the fuel pool, wherever they put it in dry casks is better than where it is right now. Okay, now the Diablo Canyon nuclear reactor, what are the multiple risks there in that double reactor complex right on the California coast? Yeah, Diablo Canyon is, the, uh, in my mind, the most dangerous reactor in the United States. It was known when they built the plant that a, a Richter earthquake with ground accelerations of 0.4 g, four tenths the acceleration of, of uh, gravity, could hit the plant, and that's why they built it. Well, as they were building it, they discovered other earthquake faults that were much nearer to the plant that could double that to 0.75 g. And they didn't change the plant. They just changed the numerical analysis to make the plant fit an earthquake that was you know, twice as severe. And what we found, uh, Fairwinds just, just produced a report that we sent to the NRC. And the big thing they're ignoring is not the gross collapse of the building in the event of a, of a Richter 0.7G earthquake. It's something called instrument chatter, and um, it's, it's really not spoken about very often in nuclear circles, but you know, hopefully Fairwinds can bring it to the forefront. You know you have switches on, your, uh, on the wall that turn a light on. Well, they have switches in nuclear plants, too. We call them relays. And if the ground shakes, the relay turns on and off without any human intervention. Now, we found an NRC report that shows that the NRC has said there's a 100% probability that in the event of an earthquake, some of those relays are going to wind up in the wrong position. So if you want a pump to be on, the relay is going to be off. If you want a pump to be off, the relay is going to be on because they'll, they're, this relay chatter will cause them to bounce back and forth. And at the end of the earthquake, they won't be in the right position. And it's a really serious problem and has been unanalyzed at Diablo Canyon. In my opinion, Diablo Canyon should be shut down until they analyze that problem. But, of course, that would be a four- or five-year effort, and they may as well throw in the towel. So they are choosing to ignore the problem rather than really analyze this relay chatter issue. 
Well, this is the first I've heard of this. I guess we can say we're breaking this on Radio EcoShock. You are. You are. It's, uh, you know, it's in the deep bowels of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's files, but they don't want to talk about it either. People who work with relays have seen them buzz. You know, they'll, uh, we'll, we'll be posting a video in the next, next couple of weeks about relay chatter. And they routinely will buzz when they're not working right, when the springs are worn and tired. They'll sit there and go, Bzzz. well, in the event of an earthquake, that will happen anyway, uh, even if it's a brand new relay, because they'll just bounce. And uh, the switches will turn on and off and on and off and on and off. And then when the earthquake ends, there's no guarantee they'll be where you want them to be. And then we have David Lockbaum. He's a nuclear expert from the Union of Concerned Scientists. He says Diablo Canyon has never met the basic requirements for fire protection. Now, how can the NRC allow this nuclear plant to keep operating? Well, it's happening in Region 4 of the NRC. And uh, to my mind, Region 4 is the uh, most industry-friendly region in the, in the country. You know, Region 4 covers uh, California, but all the way out to, essentially to the Mississippi River. Uh, we had Fort Calhoun, which was the plant that was surrounded by the Missouri River, that was a Region 4 reactor. We had San Onofre, which had you know gross failures of its steam generator. And if we let it to the uh, to the NRC, they would have started that plant back up. And were it not for Friends of the Earth and and the Fairwinds report that went with that, uh, San Onofre would be running with damaged steam generators today. The NRC in Region 4 has never seen a nuclear reactor it doesn't like. And now, of course, you've got Diablo Canyon with miserable fire protection designed for an earthquake half the size as what geologists know it will encounter, and yet the Nuclear Regulatory Commission continues to let it run. Uh, the, the concept's called grandfathering, and basically they say once you've got your license, we're not going to take it away. You've been grandfathered in. If we find anything new, we won't make it apply to you. That's what's happened. The, the NRC has said, well, it was, what was good in 1960 when this plant was designed is fine for it to uh, continue to operate all the way until uh, 2045 if Diablo Canyon has its way. You can see the same thing happening in Japan about the height of the uh, tsunami wall that they had there, you know. Well, that's the height you build it, so we'll just let you keep operating. Now, this new report, is it going to be available online, and who did you do it with? Yeah, we published a, uh, I think it's about a 45-page expert report that was sent to the NRC a week and a half ago with a legal filing that was sponsored by Friends of the Earth. Basically, we determined that Diablo Canyon never should have been allowed to run because it violated a federal law. It's called 10 CFR 50. That's nuclear law, and it's part 59, 5059, which basically says that when you know a plant has problems and you change your analytical approach to solve that problem, the public has a right to know it. That didn't happen at Diablo Canyon. The public was not informed that uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, the owner of Diablo Canyon, made gross changes in all of the assumptions in order to get Diablo Canyon qualified to a much larger earthquake. The argument should have been made in 1980 and uh, now Friends of the Earth is, is taking the argument forward in uh, 35 years later. Does the NRC have to respond? Do you expect them to? I expect that they will. Uh, I don't know if they're on a clock. When the public finds a problem, we have to notify the NRC within 30 days or else we lose our right to complain. But when the NRC finds a problem, they can drag their feet for years. So I'm not sure when the NRC will respond and I'm not optimistic that it'll be very quickly. Let's hope we can avoid an earthquake in the meantime. Yeah, well, that's what the Japanese are hoping, too, with their volcanoes. Well, th now, this super dangerous San Onofre nuclear plant in California was finally shut down, maybe because the operator couldn't afford a third refit to fix that damaged piping and, and equipment. Is there any chance the operators of Diablo Canyon will finally shut it down? What could make it happen? They should shut it down because it's not safe. Unfortunately, if we have to wait until the big one comes and then uh, 
you know, wipe out the the corridor between L.A. and, and San Francisco. Diablo Canyon is south of San Francisco but north of L.A. on the coast. What could make it happen is, um, is renewables. I've been telling people, if you want to shut a nuclear plant down, put a solar collector on your roof, an electric solar collector. And why is that is that the uh, nuclear plants don't make money at night. They lose money at night. They make money at the peak of the day uh, from essentially 11 o'clock in the uh, morning until uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's when the electric demand is highest, and that's when they can charge the most for their electricity. Well, if citizens like you and I and, and a million others put a solar collector on the roof, that's exactly when the peak power is for your solar collector, from about 11 until 3 o'clock. So the citizens would offset that peak and make nuclear uneconomical at its peak, and in which case the owners would shut them down on, on economics. So follow the money, follow the money. I like that. Solar power to kill off nuclear. Do you have other news? As we wrap up here, do you have other news from Fairwinds Energy Education that you would like to pass on? Well, we just posted a, uh, an incredible uh, video just today. I gave a speech out in San Francisco at a conference called The Wave, W-A-V-E, and it was put on by Life Chiropractic, and there were 1,600 chiropractors from around the world, and I spoke about the four myths that have yet to be addressed as a result of the, the Fukushima Daiichi accident. It's a 20-minute it's a speech, and we're running out of time, but if your listeners are interested, if they go to fairwinds.org and look up the wave, they'll find the speech. And it's uh, frankly, it's one of the most powerful speeches I've ever given. And uh, I'd encourage people to listen to the unlearned lessons from Fukushima. Yeah, it's lively. It's almost like a TED Talk, in my opinion. And I want to tell listeners that Fairwinds is spelled with an E. It's the old English spelling of FAIR, F-A-I-R-E, winds.com. This is Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. I first reported on Fukushima the day it happened with a series of emergency podcasts. My best source of information has consistently been our guest, Arnie Gunderson. Arnie, we all owe you and your partner Maggie a lot for your tireless work that you put into our nuclear safety. Thank you so much for helping us again on Radio EcoShock. Well, thanks for having me, Alex.